we're back. Make some noise, people! Yeah! It's poetry slam time. We're gonna get funky. All righty. All right, as I said, poetry slam is the competitive art of performance. Poetry. Normally how this works is I would run around through the crowd and grab five people and say, you, 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 you're going to be judges. And it's like, I'm not qualified. Who cares? That's kind of the point. You know, the whole thing is the democratization of poetry to bring it back to the people and out of the hands of the intellectuals. Although we love intellectuals, you know, they shouldn't be critiquing everything, right? So, uh, but because A for time and B for pragmatism's sake, instead of uh, doing the five randomly chosen audience members, we are going to have uh, only three uh, judges tonight, and they are going to be three of our features for the evening. So, you are in the hands of experts in a way. Normally you have five judges, the high score is dropped and the low score is dropped, and the three middle scores are added together and that creates your score. So you're, the, the lowest you could possibly have is a 0.0, .0 and the highest you could possibly get is a 30 because each inevitably every individual poet poem is going to be scored from zero to 10, always with a decimal point because you know poets aren't too good at counting sometimes. So. 0 0.002 wouldn't really, really work for us. So, Poetry Slam works like this. I'm going to draw the order of the poets, then they're gonna come up one by one as I, as I introduce them. They're gonna perform a poem. Poets, pay attention if you're competing tonight. We've got 10 poets competing tonight. Each poet gets three minutes with a 10 second grace period. That's three minutes and 10 seconds to perform one poem of their own construction. They may not use props, costumes, or musical accompaniment. So it's you and you alone. Props, things like that. Like, so if you have a poem piece about your keys and you go, ooh, my keys, that's a prop. Boom, you're done. You're disqualified. Boo. Okay. If, I mean, and your poem could be 30 seconds long if you really want it to, but you know, you can get up to three minutes, 10 seconds. If you go three minutes and 11 seconds, ooh, you get a half point deducted from your score. Every 10 seconds beyond that you go over is an additional half point. So if you do a six minute poem, you're gonna be hurting score wise. So keep your poems to three minutes and 10 seconds or less. No props, costumes, musical, accompaniment, etc. Then I'm gonna say, hey judges, hold your score. They're gonna hold your score and I'm gonna tell you what, you know, what they get and it's gonna be fun. All right, who wants to know the order? <laughs> well, you can't know until somebody helps me select it. So can I get an audi audience member, somebody, anybody? Somebody come up, how you fall? Come on up. Nothing fancy, you're not going to be performing or anything. Poets, who are competing tonight, I'm only going to use your first name because A, I won't screw up your last and I won't feel bad about that. Um, B, just hand me stuff and I will say, the first person going up, no, keep, yeah, yeah, yeah keep on rolling. This is, this is your job. You're not getting paid, but. You're, you're paid in, in wings and, and, and uh, things like that, food, yum. Eric is going to be our first performance of the night. Woo! Keep him coming to me. One that went down. And second up is going to be Dan. Put your hands together for Eric and Dan. Come on, what, come on. <laughs> Next up will be D'Angelo. That's the spirit. D'Angelo will be Amy. Keep them coming. <laughs> then we have Xander. <laughs> then comes Maurice. <laughs> then Emily. <laughs> Next poet up is Colette. <laughs> then will be Chad. Thank you very much. And last in the first round will be Rebecca. Yeah. Noise is your friend. This is a poetry slam. This is not us hanging out, pussyfooting around, going, you know, being polite, golf clap, going, oh, that was a lovely pop. No. No, here we make noise because, you know, our judges, they know the score, they know what's going on. The judges know, first and foremost, not to be influenced by the audience. Audience, influence the judges. That's your job. All the noise you make is gonna tell them what you think, what you feel. You, if they're like, I don't know, I kinda like that poem, and they hear, ah, they'll be like, okay, I like that poem more now. 
So it doesn't matter if the poem's over or not. If you hear a line you like, you can snap, you can stomp, you can make, ooh, do whatever you like. And whenever the poem is done, clap your ass off. Do what you got to, you know, go home with sore hands. Make, if, if there's a funny part, laugh. I know we're in Minnesota, but it's okay to laugh while somebody's performing. It's your job, all right? So um, also, you let the judges know what they're doing scoring-wise, like if they're doing a good job. So let's say you see this fantastic poem and the judges give it a really, really low score. What are you going to do about that? Boo, yeah. But let's say that there's this fantastic poem and they give it a really, really high score. What are you going to do with that? You'll have to do better than that, but you get the point. Okay. And, you know, what often you find in slams is if there's a really mediocre poem and then gets a really mediocre score, you just kind of hear animal noises and farm noises. And, eh, eh. So, yeah. All right. Do we, do we have our order down? Okay. Now, normally we would have a sacrificial poet, a poem, poet come up and like, perform one piece to kind of break in the judge and everything, but they are, they're already broken in. They know how we're doing. And Kari was our warm up. So, we're going to jump right into Slam. Y'all ready? Yeah. We got our time scorekeeper over there. What, what's our first person's name again? There it is, Eric. All right. Are you ready, Eric? You gonna dazzle us? Put your hands together in a really big way for Eric! War scars. He stares at the war scars on his arm, the spots where the knife slit him but did no harm because he remembers feeling more pain from bruises on the body, belted by adults with anger issues who were loved by nobody. And as they trip on their own egos and hit him hard, Given his self-complete disregard, he can't believe it's happening. Not again, the definition of struggle comes to define him. Then 10 years pass, like taking a piss, and now he's just this wannabe writing scientist. Use his skill to heal, but can't heal the hate in his heart. And he always feels miserable, like he just can't start. And why won't you hit him and cause him to bleed? Concentrate on something else, but he knows it'll never be because he's still got memory of choke marks, of slash wrists, of tortured mother. And as they imprint, they leave behind these war scars, the kind often missed. Let me stop for a moment and tell you what I used to know. You were my universe and you were my flow. But then that river ran straight towards a black hole, so I abandoned the raft and learned to craft. Butterfly kicked till I had no kicks left. Then I was left standing on this rocky shore, unsure of what direction to take or how to begin to cure what ailed me, or this emptiness inside, filling it with many ways to alter the mind, never curing the war scars, only killing some time, always on the lookout for another river to grind. But now I've gone blind, and I don't know which way to go. I got my ear to the ground, and I'm listening for that flow. No sound anywhere, no escaping from this hole. Darkness all around till the day I grow. Don't you know, these are my war scars. That was Eric. Now the key to the speed and goodness of a slam is me not spending much time up here. So the judges know what they're doing. As soon as I get up here, they're gonna be like, this is what the score is, and I'm going to say, judges, please, hold them up. And wait, there we go. All right. And I always read low to high. It's suspenseful that way. I've got a 7.8. You, you now, like, do what you're like, yay, I agree with that, or boo, I don't agree with that, or eh, it's okay, whatever. So i got a 7.8. I've got an 8, and I've got an 8.1 for Eric. Now my time score guy is going to add those three numbers up as quickly as he possibly can, and then he's going to call out the uh, total for that particular poem. I didn't tell him that he had to make noise doing all this. Yeah. That is a 23.9. Put it together again for Eric. We never applaud the scores. We always applaud the poets, OK? All right, so that's good. There you go. That's your first taste. We're going to keep on rolling. There's going to be three rounds. We're going to do 10 poets in the first round. Then we're going to cut it down to you know, a number of poets in the second round, and then cut it down again for just a couple few in the last round. We're just going to see based on time, but let's keep things rolling. Put your hands together for our next poet coming to the stage, Dan. <laughs> It's called Tunnel Vision.
in fact, is quite scary. Tunneling through, it's fucking tough. I've had pleasure and comfort, but had enough. Only concealers to the actual reality, very much of the brutality, locked into three, four, or more spaces, separated by whom? Self-imposed, unconnectable, with a dull down point of observation, a nation united in fear and hate. In fact, it is quite scary. Watching reflection of ourselves more into uh, Guess is correct. Zombie children. This will infect our little ones more so than we have been. Ultimate conditioning, steering towards the edge of the cliff. Train, full speed, ahead, all aboard. So swift. Pardon me for searching to be free. From the abstract love clung to hate psychosis, at least that's how film and stories portray it. Number one solution, number one question today. Listening very close will aid your recovery. And the sirens you will hear saying, awake, you've been dreaming. Hands over ears must be removed. Turn around, start running backwards until you find the fence. Climbing over it takes a sober, sh sober shoulder, no dollars spent. As you climb with all your will, sweating and pulling upwards, sickened men and women, children try and stone you. And then some will stand back and get stoned and laugh and look at you and say, I wish I was that kid. Throwing rocks, twigs, anything to bring you back to their silent hill where we all still ponder on who created. Shaking off all these blood-soaked viruses, breaking the unseen ties, old-fashioned barbed wire, tripping over past pain, new ones also sever your grip. The top of this fence is sure to break, skin rip. In fact, it is quite scary. Some emotions now, when it is heard, will stop. So much that you could tear up, tell drowning. Get back up, little boy and girl. Our world needs you more than ever. Our world needs you and that fleshy, massive beating heart. I bring words of pain and show this door with love. It's fucking scary out there once you step through. Unraveling all the things like to hide, you find new. Once it started, no turning back, keep on. To press forward, greener grass, brighter night. Bring your flashlight. Have your brain beside beating heart. Shh. Quiet. Listen. Feel, then speak out on the end of the start. Thank you. That was Dan. Keep it going. Oh, hi. Waiting for my judges, judges, judges. They are ready. Okay, I've got a seven. I got a 7.8. And I've got a 7.9. All righty. That was good pacing on his part. So if, if you're performing tonight and you've got like a really short poem, you can stretch it out. You don't have to be like, blah, 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 just, you know, because I mean, if you're only going to take up 30 seconds, you might as well try to stretch it to a minute. You know, it, could, it couldn't hurt. What we got? The 22.7. Put your hands together for Dan. And welcome to the stage, our next poet, D'Angelo. D'Angelo, are you here? Could somebody have written something that looked like D'Angelo and I got it wrong? He's not here today. I'll already sign up then. I'm just confused. All right. Is Emily next? Amy. Amy. I'm sorry. You're right. All right. Well, I hope you're prepared, Amy, because it's your turn. Come on up, Amy. <laughs> dolphins, dolphins. I love dolphins. They are not fish and they come in many colors. And one more thing, I love dolphins. Yeah. <laughs> one 
once again for Amy. I can't tell you how thoroughly entertained I am right now. <laughs> I love dolphins more now, I'm serious. Okay, all right, judges. What do you think she was lacking in substance? Come on, really? All right, I've got a 6.5, a 9.0, and a 9.5 for Amy. <laughs> now, in my little bits of banter time I have, I'll tell you a little bit about the paintings that I have around here, a little bit maybe. I don't talk about my art much. All right, what do we got? That's a 25 even. All right, put them together again for Amy, and keep those hands moving together for Xander. I have seen suicide with the shrug of a shoulder. A man dons a dress and waves his handkerchief at the oncoming train. Suicide was sexy, but it went out of style. It ended in the 90s with a bang. Gay teens have always been a retro. Don't let go. Don't let go. Pick up the phone and dial 1-800-SUICIDE. If you forget the number, just remember how your daddy died. In Jonestown, they decided to be suicided as a way to come closer to God. Maybe that wasn't so odd. Maybe Christ was a suicide. My friend from the Cub Scouts blew his brains out. Afterwards, he came to me in a dream. He said, Xander, I thought you killed yourself. I said, I thought you killed yourself. He's like, gotcha. A little extreme for April Fools. But I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming in the easy way he'd say, one day I'm going to kill myself. So tell me, dead poets, what does it mean? Was it decision, despair, or disease? Did Anne take notes from Sylvia to find the best air to breathe? I'm not suicidal, but I know how I'd do it. I'd jump out of an airplane into the blades of a helicopter, be splattered into a volcano, exploded, my ashes will fall in the bowl of a hookah. My friends will all smoke me and talk to me on the Ouija to find out if my sin's been forgiven, to find out if my sin was a sin to begin. Xander. All righty. This is a big money slam, by the way. Judges, I've got an 8.1. I've got an 8.2. And I've got a 9.6. All right. Slams around the country, around the world, they have different awards. I mean, I've, been, I've competed in slams where I've traveled cross country to compete and I won a pen, I'm not kidding, or a candy bar, things like that. And then there are you know, slams where you can win $10,000, $20,000. Um, typically, they you know, 50 bucks, something like that. Tonight, first place wins 350 bucks. It's pretty damn awesome. 250? 250. It's still a lot. I, 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 I'd give you the other 100 if I had it. Okay, 250. All right, my bad. Sorry, I don't want to false advertise. What do we got? Always interrupt me because I'm bad. It's a 25.9 for Xander. Once again for Xander. And keep that rolling for Maurice. So, real quick, uh, this poem is written after Kevin Kovo. Jamila Woods, and Roger Bonaire God. Uh, it's called, Where is Life Leading Me? Because nerd isn't sexy yet. Leading me through life is a sexy of nerd. Foxy, like natural naps condensed to dreadlock or network of kink hair, orbit to afro, unfuckwittable, chocolate tinge like honey kiss skin like nerds whose eyes sun dance on the horizon of book pages we thumb through knowledge and sculpt ourselves in the cracked lenses of, li of literature baptized in comic books life be sexy nerd sexy 
Led through ocean-hued skies with cocaine-colored clouds and switchblades of grass, and my cousin, wielding skin more dark night than Batman, and my smile more friendly than your neighborhood Spider-Man. We were the breakfast of champions equipped with Saturday morning cartoons, ran through backyards like Power Rangers defending the Earth-type nerd sexy. We sweated sunbeams until street lamps bounced light off the boulevard. Skipping nights of sleep to witness the magic of Mario's boots as he jumped to break bricks with head or high speeds of blue hedgehogs breaking sound barriers to break evil scientists or scaling chilling dungeons as a green tunic wearing adventurer linking a princess to the past. This is for the nerd who grew up too shy to talk to girls but fingers played bass lines on Super Nintendo controllers because nerd wasn't sexy enough. You could have at any time. Nerd was always sexy. It's called confidence or adorable now, so be yourself, nerd. I've tried. It works. Learn to be social, nerd. Learn the value of people through narratives of fiction, nerd. Don't be a work and regress, nerd. Don't close self off to real world, nerd. Never barricade reality with comics that serve as sword and shield, nerd. Let down your awkward guard, nerd. Tone down your eccentric, nerd. Sometimes adjust your tongue and code switch to cultivate friendship, nerd. I've been in a company of blood and broken teeth, nerd. Accept the company of kickback thieves in your guild and bloom into spontaneous retrograde beauty, similar to the smoke clouds that blossom like flowers trailing from your cigarette through the jukebox chatter of everyday life. And remember, every child is an artist. It's what Picasso says. The problem is how to remain an artist once he grows up. Luckily for you, nerd, there's still a lot of growing up to do. That was Maurice. All righty. Judges, show me what you're feeling. <laughs> I've got an 8.4. I've got a 9. I've got a 9.1. There you go. Poetry is just a hobby for me. It's even though it can used to consume like literally 60 hours a week for me or, or more than that. Um, this is how we, no, I'm a painter by trade. I'm a surrealist artist. It's how I make my living. So these are prints of a couple of my paintings. And there's one out in the lobby too. What do we got? 26.5. There you go. Keep those hands together going for Maurice and keep them going for the next poet on the stage, Emily. On guard. What does this look like to you? How about a sword? No? Now you might be thinking, Emily, that is clearly a microphone. But I see things just a little bit differently. You see, this is a weapon when used correctly. A sword, a nine millimeter, a verbal guillotine slicing into your mind with carefully articulated uncertainties a noose to hang your closed mindedness on and alert you to a whole new world of possibilities. They can try to take my guns, but my freedom of speech is still with me lest they cut out my tongue, which they can't do as easily or inconspicuously. Words are powerful and wielded correctly can bring life or death, soothe you or hit you like a bullet in the chest. Truth today is comparable to taking all the ideas and theories and religions you like, throwing them in a blender and hoping you're right, because easier to digest a smoothie of lies than to gulp down the hard truths of life. We're not always going to understand why things play out the way they do, but that doesn't mean we get to dictate what's truth. It also doesn't mean we should passively stay silent in the presence of lies. How will people know truth if they never see it? If you never hear it, how do you believe it? How do you adopt truth if it's a child you've never met? A child abandoned by our society given pitied passing glances at best. The child of truth is crying in the streets and we ignore the child for fears of offending. This also applies to me. A gun left unfired, a sword left in its sheath are both ineffective like secret beliefs. We need to use our words. We need to speak. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm also not saying just keep your lips flapping, because words are just words if not backed up by action. Thank you. That's Emily. All 
Friday. Mes Jogis. I've got a 6.3. I've got an 8 and an 8.6. Make noise. This painting is titled Cold Air Balloon. Just so you know. Uh, yeah, I'm having a new one built as we speak, but my old one's still up. It's virgosurreal.com. Virgo is in the astronomical sign, and surreal is in surrealism. So virgosurreal.com is my website. Yeah. What do we have? 22.9 for Emily. Put your hands together, applaud the poet, not the score. And keep making noise for our next poet of the stage, Colette. Colette, no? Okay. Too embarrassed? I didn't know this was going to be good. All right, moving on to the next poet then. Last chance? No? No? Okay. Next poet coming to the stage is Chad. Come on, Chad. Faith of the Hypocrite. I sit as great grandmother Tik Talik recounts the tale of timelessness deep within our DNA suspended when proud Kashapona walked tall of how that fantastic first fish found his way by scaled fin, fist over hand. Our first ancestor shed his stony skin to romp and thrive in gluttonous sin. Those boundless developing Devonians Greedy gasped for air as they fled to land. She took brief moments to recollect how debonair and dapper he looked. So dashingly dignified and upright in that magnificent tweed suit, or was it seaweed? But my, did he not develop far beyond his par of class. From out of nothing springs something, a fantastical fungal spore explosion, beginning premise established, beckons. All sides give account for their faith. It is then zealous devil with gusto appears, neither present in the prospective vanguard, nor peddling and pilfering in the background, but as usual in those insincere specifics. That bearded, dragon-headed, crimson bastard, thrust with haste from heavens for pride, captivate with speculative theories of Gnostic predication, prognostication, and pontification. A duplicitous, profane, antediluvian gap spanning theological rationale, eluding scriptural analysis. Perhaps when it all comes to the end, we shall find UFOs will bear the brunt of blame, as Doc decreed. And although old MacDonald has a farm, don't try convincing him that rooster he has is merely a bird, because his belief is based on faith, an unsound religion with no foundation. He knows about the fantasy some call science, and being so educated, erudite, and enlightened, that when Samson leveled the geologic pillars, redirect and reason were deflected by blind devotion. He knows without a doubt we developed with dear old great-granddad Protungulatum Donne, but we who bear no tail are obligated to descend from apes, leaping lemurs, or maybe mudskippers. I am persuaded when the Big Bang brought us forth, it deafened certain of civilization's common sense, a period of time, a period in space, within a period. Entire unrestricted universe pressurized, compressed. The true trick lies not in the fairy tale others tell, but in the teller of the tale and what they forget to say, is we also share much in common with the toothy alligator, our alienated cousin for sure. Isn't it obvious that we are thus from them derived? Then from the simple-minded baboon or capuchin, we, the mighty predator, tearing into flesh and hunting one another for pleasure or for gain. As surely as dinosaurs turned into birds, old MacDonald, we came from crocodiles. When the rooster crows, crocodile roar! Time will be as real relevant as truth to you. Hypocrisy that reeks of religion condemns me as the hypocrites travel along without rationale. For their supreme truth and fundamental doctrines requiring much more faith than the creationists who believe in the supreme sustaining God, he who created all things by the power of his word and might, for our good pleasure, 
who breathes blessed life on man and land, and now beckons the hypocrite to repent. Keep on clapping for Chad. <laughs> are my judges ready? They are, it looks like. I've got a 7.8. Oh, 8.4 and an 8.7. All right. That painting is called The Great Escape. And if you didn't, if, I don't know if you saw it closely, but those are actually words leaving the page. I'm a spoken word poet. To me, the words want to leave the page. Oh, yeah. Over here. <laughs> All right. The 24.9. Claude, the poet. And keep it going for our last poet in the first round, Rebecca. Come on up. This is called The Land of 10,000 Lakes. Can you guys hear me? Okay. My Minnesota, with fraternal but not identical cities, with two determined senators, with 1,000 languages when the wind stops. My Minnesota, where I eat Lao coconut soup with a girl whose tree traces back to Finland, further back to Mongolia and Russia. The recipe from a Korean adoptee, from her Cambodian husband, from his Lao ex-mother-in-law. My Minnesota, where I learned to butcher a French Arabic song from a man whose parents left Tehran, who sounds with a British accent, whose voice untangles five tongues. My Minnesota, where I take Middle East literature from an East Asian woman with a man marked half African American, a motherless German by passport, proficient in all things Deutsch and English. He can only feel Kenya through his father. My Minnesota with my trilingual Tibetan roommate, a lover of Jerry Springer and Volkswagens, whose speakers outsung my Bollywood with Guns N' Roses, who always had Doritos in the cupboard. My Minnesota, who gives me cuisine from every country, a sports bar for every lake and pond, sometimes the aroma of 99-cent sandwiches during Lent, sometimes Hungarian goulash for Thanksgiving, always sweet corn and apples when the sun is shining. My Minnesota, with your Japanese restaurants, where the Filipino chef snuck me sushi, where the Russian bar manager left to serve the country in Iraq, where the Spanish-speaking chef crafted miso soup and gyoza. My Minnesota with your Italian restaurants, with the Czechoslovakian waitresses after class, and hungover stumbling, I fed staggering Vikings fans, where I made white lies with Sangiovese and Merlot, while the gold medal flower sign blinked through the windows. My Minnesota, how your mega ma lures me every year, how I curse I your Irish looking for parking in St. Paul. With your underpriced Aldis and your overpriced co-ops, where I can't distinguish from my bitterness for your redundant stop sign on Aiden Mill Road and my fondness for the locals who stop at it every time. My Minnesota, in exchange for multiplication and division packets, you gave me an A for a ninth grade algebra summer school. But you inspire the landscape with umpteen colleges and universities. You reimburse with infinite museums and cultural centers. Your theaters charm me back to optimism. My Minnesota, rich with labor movement history, poor with being frank, where farmers and city folk carve niches along the Mississippi, where the churches and temples share the same sheet of concrete, where 30 below windshields send me into the arms of warm reggae tunes. My Minnesota with your bipolar seasons, how each inhumane winter you jigsaw Lake Superior's canal, 
and silence Minnehaha Falls, how each spring I have never made enough income to hate you, how each scorching summer I retreat until sunset, oh my dearest Minnesota, how each enchanting autumn haze I fall for you all over again. That's Rebecca. Georges. I've got an 8.4. I've got a 9.3. And the first one of the night, a 10! I'll be getting her score in a second, but let me explain what happens next. Like I said, this is a three round poetry slam, which means poets, if you progress to the next round, you have to perform again. So you better have something. If you don't, let me know. All right. Uh, is there anybody who signed up to perform who didn't? Wave your hand in the air, make some noise. Who actually signed up, didn't perform? Just want to make sure that, you know, the two folks that had written their names down had their chance. Okay. Yeah, no? Okay. All right. 27.7. It's a 27.7 for Rebecca. All righty. So. This is going to be a cumulative slam. What that means is we are now going to go in reverse order from back to front, because everybody went from you know, one to 10. Now we're gonna go 10 to one, um, but we're doing a cut in this one. Now granted, two people just decided not to perform, so that cuts two right there, so yay. We're gonna cut to five. We're gonna go from 10 to five poets in the second round. The five highest scoring poets of this round move on. And then uh, we're going to cut it to three for the last round. Ooh. But the good thing about it is all three of those win money. So, yay. All right. So, Rebecca, are you ready for poem number two? Because you're coming right back up there. Put your hands together for Rebecca. This is called An Ancestor's Daughter. You can still hear me? Okay. In some time, without mirrors and without moons, I will ask my mother's mother's middle name. I will also ask my other mother's mother's first name. And will both my mother's fathers still be at war? And which of my lover's father's mothers will they be slaying? In that time, will both my nameless father's fathers still be drinking, sampling each other's soju and whiskey? Will their faceless father's fine fingers be clenching sake or moonshine? And who will drink who under the table in heaven? I will ask the winner the difference between stoic silences passed from the scars of cannons, intoxicated belts on boys in between infertile cornfields, or the aftershocks passed from charred rice fields, from broken husband to breaking wife from imperialist soldiers. Because even after the fire, forever I am all my mother's and all my father's unfinished dreams. When I step out of the skin and trade water for wind, will the nature of Buddhists, Confucius, and shamans greet me first or the nurture of Catholics, Protestants, the amalgamated Native Americans claim me? And is the culprit for my temper birthed from the stubborn Korean sun or passed down from the hand of the sometimes Austrian but usually German valleys? Is my passive aggressive nature a regift from the Norwegian and Finnish? Or is it residuals from Korean hierarchy and etiquettes that resisted Japanese cleansing? Do I smoke? following in the, the father's footsteps of the French Revolution? Or is there a cellular affinity to the ajumas that hold both Koreas on one back? But my father's fathers will still be fighting, and my mother's mothers still mending pieces of battlefields, 
collecting emotions the men couldn't afford to carry. And then, one by one, I will find all their fathers' fathers and all their mothers' mothers, tracing the land of the morning calm, digging up graves in the land of the rising sun, trying to unriddle the past peasants and prisoners from the land of the free and the home of the brave, until there are no more cloths to caress, no more dialects to decipher, no new travesties to untangle, and I will find all my mamas, papas, gods, and all my daddies, mommies, deities. And those spirits will be sitting around a pool table, together playing darts with stars, drinking their dreams, and making a snow smoke storm out of their fears. And I'll ask them, peering through their telescopes that spin like kaleidoscopes, which name and which cloud in this time? Secret stories of my veins and vitality, which crusade and which feud in this time, from all those last centuries that led to now, without a reflected image in evening light, to reveal rivalry and race. Tell me her first name and tell me her middle name. And they will laugh at me and say, everything was everywhere, always, all this time. That's Rebecca. All righty. Go, judges. Put them up. We've got a 7.9. We've got an 8.3. I don't hear any noise. And I've got a 9. Yeah. I realized just a minute ago that I told you that it's a cumulative slam. I didn't tell you why it's cumulative. Okay, so we're going to take the score from the first round and then add it to the score of the second round. And then those folks will go up to the next round. And then the cumulative score of all three rounds is who determines who's the winner, you know, first, second, third place, etc. Okay, cool. Now, it's a 25.2 for Rebecca. Make noise and keep making noise. Lots and lots of noise. Let's bring Chad back to the stage. White privilege. I sit in sociology, and this white lady tells me I for sure have partaken of white privilege. And I want to ask, was it when I watched as my mother was being raped, as the man held a cold steel gun to my head? Was it as I came home from school in fear, the only white child in an all-black neighborhood, who had no idea of the culture or the city, or the place which I had been brought to? Was I a partaker of white privilege when I was thrust into prison for being ignorant of the law? Was I a partaker of white privilege because I was in university, being able to learn, being able to sit under her wise tutelage? Or was I a partaker of white privilege because she, was married to a black man, and her distorted view was pushed onto me. Chad. Alrighty. Y'all having fun? Yeah. Good. You should be. I'm having fun. Let's make some noise. Are you having fun? If you don't do it voluntarily, I will make you have fun, darn it! <laughs> kidding. Well, I'm not kidding. All right, I've got a 7.1. I've got a 7.2. And I've got a 7.8 for Chad. Give it up. Yep. I've got one more painting that's out in the front, like that lobby where you just come into the theater here. There's one that's on an easel off to the side. That one's called The Storm Catchers. Thank you. Thank you very much. That one. These, these, the originals, the original paintings are like yay big. That one, the big, it's like that. that it's really, really big. It's bigger than my arms. What do we got? The 22.1 for Chad. Always applaud the poet, not the score. Screw the score. Screw the score. Yeah, it's nothing. All right. Now, put your hands together again. Make lots of noise for Maurice. Uh, 
This poem is written after, ooh, this is tall, sorry. <laughs> this poem is written after uh, Idris Goodwin and Nate Marshall. It's called, How to Stop Strangers from Committing Suicide Through a Telephone Hotline at Age 15. Tell them to do it tomorrow, then listen to the downbeat of broken breaths as they realize that tomorrow is a reality for them. Make sure they know you care, not because you are 15 and are just as young as 85% of the voices quivering at the end of the receiver, nor because your only income is invoiced under the table and you are forced to tread miles beneath piles of snowfall, carless to an unmarked PO box to acquire checks, but because you know the deep, cold tendency of feeling invisible within the phantom embrace of your family's warm arms, arm yourself with the wisdom of experience, meaning read, meaning read more, meaning study, meaning experience life and the beauty of breathing. Let them know that they are beautiful. Despite the scars carving hieroglyphics into upturned limp wrists, decipher the design in one glance and know they misspelled love for themselves on their self. Speak with the precision of a bomb specialist snipping trick wire for your words, tightrope over a bed of swords. Surgeon with a scalpel is what you are, you gypsy, you knife juggler. Allow your voice to be as steady as a stick up kid holding a hammer, holding the hammer when you pull the trigger of knives stuck in the crevice of their backs. No, they performed mental act acrobatics as a safety mechanism to trick themselves into believing that their life isn't important and that you are dehumanized to the concept of death. They don't know that you are black and 15 and a pound full of years into high school and that your uncle at 37 blew out the back of his head into a, uh, to a mural of wedding ring insecurities against a backdrop of granite as if God finger painted forgive me and a suicide note of his blood when his wife left him. They don't know that you are 15 and Southside Minneapolis hued black and of hum hymns tuned to the melody of poor Hennessy drained on the thinning breaths of a dwindling friend whose fingertips grew cold in an embrace of your warm grip. Listen to their stories as if they were a miracle because they are a miracle. Like the courage they conjured with quivering fingers dialing this number into the silence of the receiver when, they answer, when you answer to convince them to die another day. Let them know that they can't rewrite their own history while in a coffin. You've never tried it before, but be sure by the steady aim reverberating in the, in the confidence of your voice that they know that today isn't their day to die. That's Maurice. I am thoroughly impressed across the board here, folks. I got an 8.2. A 9.3 and a 9.3. When I say I'm impressed, it's because I've been doing this a long time, and um, I've been to lots and lots of slams, and maybe I just wasn't there that night, but I had not one of the poets who are competing tonight. I've never seen them on any stage before, on any slam stage or anything, so it's not like they're really well rehearsed in that genre. So that's impressive. Thank you. Well, you're awesome. What do we got? to 26.8. Nice. That was Maurice. Now let's bring Xander back up to the stage. The goose wonders where her head is gone and why her blood is dripping up. Chris tells me he doesn't like showers because the first blast of cold nails him to the stall. I tell him to adjust the temperature before stepping into the stream. Now his hair is cleaner than it's ever been. I put my wallet away before collecting my change. I put my wallet away before change is made. The goose has never seen a room so small and can't remember if there was ever a Christmas so hot. A fly flies into the belly of a bullfrog saying, hey, you eat me. Chris's eyes glaze like he'd be gay for me if there were no women. He thinks, can you read my thoughts? I think I think so. Can you read my thoughts? He thinks I think so. His chin glistens with goose juice and the goose wonders where the goose has gone. That's Xander. <laughs> Waiting for my judges. 
I'm not supposed to comment on poems really until the scores go up, and then I can. Yeah. Okay, they're up. I've got a seven. I've got a 7.9 and an 8.7 for Xander. So that, all, all that went through my head was, I wonder where my goose has gone. I don't know why that came into my, it's like a cross between Finding Nemo and his poem. It's obscure. All right. What do we got? So 23.6 for Xander. I'm hoping that blowing your ear jumps out. All right, we've got one more poet in the second round, and then we're going to go and do just three more quick poems for the third round. But our last poet of the second round is, once again, put them together for Amy. Giraffes, giraffes, I love giraffes. They eat leaves and they have long necks. Next, don't next. And one more thing, I love giraffes. <laughs> uh, Amy, once again, y'all. If she makes it to the next round, I swear to God, we're going to hear something from the ocean. I hope we, oh, wait. What was the first one again? Dolphins. Dolphins then giraffes. Birds. <laughs> got a 6.5. I've got an 8.3 and an 8.7 for Amy. <laughs> and our score is... That's a 23.5. Put your hands together for Amy once again. This next round is going to be quick. It's going to be a flash. What my time and score guy is going to do right now is he's adding up all the scores and everything. He's going to take the scores from the uh, top three poets, top three score, cumulative scores, um, and then we are going to push on from there. Uh, our wonderful feature, eBay, um, has to skedaddle but he's going to pass the mantle of judging on to Ed Bach. <laughs> that would be funny. All right, while he's telling up the scores, I'm going to tell you about the local poetry slam scene. Like I said, we've got two slams here in the Twin Cities, one in Minneapolis. It is held on the fourth Tuesday of every month at Kieran's Irish Pub, downtown Minneapolis on Block E. Fourth Tuesday, uh, doors open at 7, slam starts at 8. I believe it's a $5 cover charge there for uh, the competition. Free if you compete. And the competition is open to anyone. And it is all ages. Uh, what's that? It might be seven now. It is kind of going up worldwide as, as Slam becomes more and more popular. I just told him you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. He was supposed to tell you that, too. All right. Uh, if you want more information about the Minneapolis Slam, then just check out uh, SlamMN, as in Slam Minnesota, SlamMN.org, and you can get information about that. The St. Paul Poetry Slam happens on the first Monday of every month, the first Monday at uh, the Artists' Quarter right here in downtown St. Paul, Artists' Quarter Jazz Club. Doors open at 7, Slam starts at 8. $7 cover charge, uh, free if you compete. It is 21, or I'm sorry, 18 plus for that one. It's not all ages, it's 18 plus. And uh, you can get information about that at soap-boxing.com. Soap, boxing, soap-boxing.com. Cool. Do we have our order? Would you like to pass that up for me? Can I get another assistant, please? You want to come back? <laughs> Jennifer, right? Yeah, OK. All right. We've got three poets going up in the last round. She's determining the order by random draw. Just hand me something, anything, yeah. First up in the last round is going to be Rebecca. <laughs> After her will be Maurice. 
Thank you very much. And last in the last round will be Xander. You ready to keep things going? Let's do this. Put your hands together for Rebecca. Sarah Kay did a TED talk about, I think, spoken word poetry. Um, and she titled her poem, If I Should Have a Daughter, so I wrote one kind of after hers. But I didn't agree with everything she said. She said she's not for angry poetry, and I am. But otherwise, I liked her poem. And, um, if I should have a daughter, I will tell her she doesn't have to trade the azure song of her voice for chicken legs to marry the pompous prince on land. I will tell her she doesn't have to tame a hairy beast with buck teeth tantrums and fists of fury to find a gentleman. I will tell her no matter how many times she gets down on her hands and knees for Anastasia, Drizella, and her stepmother, it will never be good enough for narcissists. So save yourself some cartilage and learn from Echo's mistakes. No new infomercial product, glass windows, marble tiles will be enough for a god falls in love with his or her entitled delusions. So skip daisies, skip lingerie, skip candlelight recipes, skip sticks and stones, sorry, self-blame, skip thinking it's about how you let the bristles touch the ground at a 45 degree angle, or how you didn't fold the rags into origami and place them two inches from the wall and one millimeter from the door. I will tell her she can wear seashells as a bra if she chooses and have squirrels, mice, jellyfish, seahorses, even teapots as friends. But she must have a support system beyond the seven dwarves who are trying to get down her pants. <laughs> I will tell her that some women have lived richer lives marrying a magical dwarf instead of the prince. I will tell her she can keep the king up all night telling stories to stay alive because even men who are captive of their own addictions can fall in love with a good story that never ends. I will tell her life is short, so if a non-narcissistic man wants to take her for a carpet ride, so be it. But if she ever meets a blue man with Robin Williams' voice to remind herself who, who carried her ass for nine months. If I should have a daughter, I will tell her there are two identical white mushrooms. One will take your life like an invisible spell, first consuming your intestines and swallowing your bronchioles. The other can nourish your organs, your mouth, your mane to grow. I will tell her a snake's venom can kill you long after it's done breathing, that some butterflies can smell each other three miles away, that nymphs, locusts, and a single summer can devour rings in an oak tree's trunk that weathered hundreds of thousands of moons and lightning storms, that the small inconspicuous spider's web is actually one of the strongest materials on Earth, so pay attention to the details, that Bees pollinate flowers in exchange for nectar, which turns to honey, that hawk moths visit beehives with a skull and crossbones etched in their cape while hoarding honey every double shift, and the worker bees are charmed by his sneaky, squeaky sounds that may as well be their queen. I will tell her that some salmon do make it upstream against gravitational currents to mate and go home. That a mold grows on trees and releases spores that grow inside an ant's head, controlling his brain to walk into a sticky death trap that a parasite from cow dung finds its way inside an ant so that it sleepwalks every evening to the tip-top blade of a grass to be eaten in a pasture, reincarnated back into the cow's digestive system so Groundhog Day can repeat itself. <laughs> that our bones have unique cells called osteoblasts, which means cell birth, and they rebuild broken limbs. If I should have a daughter, I will tell her the, the sparkling glitter of helium and hydrogen be dazzling the night sky is the same as in our hemoglobin. I will tell her that with my heart, that I love her no matter what, and our love is sustained by valves as thin as tissue paper that pump 7,000 liters of stars each sunrise. So with our blood and star matter, we will always have the strengths and sonnets to make our own fairy tales come true.
Keep that going for Rebecca. Right, we're gonna be out of here soon. We got only two more poems. Judges. I've got an 8.2. Got a 9.5. And a 9.7. Yeah. All right. Anybody have any questions about slam, stuff like that? No? Happy to answer questions after the show. Why not? All right. Mr. Time Score Man, what we got? That's a 27.4 for Avaca. Lots and lots of noise for that. And keep that noise a cooking for Maurice. My pops heard a Heineken like John Coltrane cuddling a saxophone. Reclined back cool. In his chair like Miles Davis, he commanded conversations in a crowd of chocolate-skinned peers peering with a bronze-eyed gaze at the cats whose voices cat called scales of jazz soul say, I like to hang around words and overhear them talking to one another. So as a child sitting on the sidelines, my ears eavesdropping in on their conversations, I always wondered why I was so transfixed with the curve of the lips they respected the perspective garb swayed y'all, dig. Of the pool hall cool cats cracking eight balls in the side pockets as the boy in the blue vest watches as they excel melodies that bob my head to the rhythms in tune that tantalize the room. I consume jazz and soul daily, y'all. Moon strutting down the boulevard, drowning out universes with my headphones, remembering when my pops cross-faded beatbox with crescendos to the breakbeat lyrics of Nat Iwa King Iwa Cole, unforgettable. How I emulated these traits at school, I Remember in the lunchroom cipher sessions, I began the progressive lessons of emulating rhythm sections. Now, the kids question, yo, dog, why you think you're so cool? And my reply, hey, because I'm so smooth like my pops. Spinning vinyls in navy blue lit rooms filled with haze as jazz and hip hop syncopated crowds of chocolate skin peers out here from the sidelines as a kid. Diggable like the planets, uncommon with my sense, knit of tongue, most definite on a journey like a trial called quest, an outcast, written in black thoughts, cotton stars, ninja abyss, mass appeal, gang star around midnight. My insights affirmation was George Benson sipping brews, notorious like monks, the mountain tops, growing to Thelonia, straight, no chasers, with chase away, straight, no impressionable to the impressions and printed from the experience. So uh, how can jazz be dead if, if I'm still alive and how can hip hop die when Wu-Tang is forever, they say that life, it's like a piano, y'all. It just depends on how you play it. So this is dedicated to the way I grew to mute the rhythm section of life's jazz on someone all a crowd of lunchroom spectators with the smoothest verse ever. Thank you. That's Maurice. I'd be giving them lots and lots of compliments if I, went, if I didn't already know they were, they were like awesome. So, 8.7, 9.6, 9.7 <laughs> Uh The three performers who are performing in this last round, don't leave, stick around after this. If you wanna get your money, you gotta be here and then we can give it to you, okay? All right, what do we got there? That's a 28 even. Put them together for that. And please make a huge amount of noise for our last performer coming up to the stage. It's Sander! So I thought there were only two rounds, so I just got to remember a poem. <laughs> Pan of the Nymph. Pan found a nymph with the head of a lamb. He gazed his lusty eyes and cock. Please, my lass, I'd make you mine, but pridefully the lamb declined. You must be a lass that has an eye for a lass, said Pan, not to be a jilted man. I like men, but you're an ass, said the lamb, and turned so Pan could see her can. Must you taunt me with thy glorious heap, he goat cried at the scornful sheep. Just go away, you libidinous creep, and into the forest she sheeply leaped. Too hot to trot, he goatly followed through shallow brambles on yellow land, thinking of the things he'd have her swallow and where to place his emative hands. 
He found her near a rocky cliff where she had taken with a ram the whiff of goat piss informed Pan that here stood Ares, king of rams. Horns held high above his hide, veins of blood crossed through his eyes, manhood raged in all his pride towards the nymph who sat between his thighs. What is your business with my niece, said Ares as he aimed his horns. I wish to admire her soft white fleece, Pan said, thinking she would look quite nice in porn. The parts of Pan that were a goat would go chase fawn girls by a moat, but the parts of Pan that were a man bade him wait and form a plan. That night when Ares mounted on his bride, through the forest the satyr sneaked, and deftly he jumped in for the ride when Ares rose to take a leak. The lamb kept on her venereal bleat, for she was nearly satisfied. But Pan felt no sweet friction on his meat. Ares had spread her thighs too wide. <laughs> That's Xander, y'all. Randy Mummy. <laughs> Judges? I've got a seven, I've got an 8.9, and a 9.3 for Xander. All right, now my time score guy is going to add those up and then bring me up the, uh, the information of what the placement is. In the meantime, I'm going to make you clap a lot. First and foremost, I want you to clap for every single one of the performers who were on the stage tonight. Round of applause for yourself for being an incredible audience. Thank you. And then a couple of side notes that are like personally like yay for me is two things. This is about global poetry, right? The diversity on the stage tonight. Yes. Thank you. This is Minnesota, y'all. I get it. 92% Caucasian, 8% everything else combined, I get it, but usually our slam stages are far, far too lacking in diversity of ethnicities, cultures, etc., and also women. I'm very happy we had several ladies on this stage tonight. <laughs> ladies, you have a voice, use them. Thank you, yeah. All right, are y'all ready for the winners of the evening? No? Okay. I are you ready for the winners? Yeah. Then give me a drum roll! All right, coming in third place with a score of a 77.7 7, is Xander! Thank you. It's a close one. Coming in second place with a score of 80.3, Rebecca! Thank you very much. Which leaves our number one first place champion type winner person with an 81.3, only one point. That is Maurice, congratulations. <laughs>